Welcome to Bread for the People, I'm Jim Serpico. My guest today is a watercolor artist, a mom, a designer, an author, a self-proclaimed color theory expert and creative entrepreneur. Jenna Rainey, thanks for joining me on Bread for the People. Thanks so much for having me on, I'm happy to be here. I, uh, I like to think of myself as a, as a creative mm -hmm. and an artist. Um, I was into music at a very early age, inspired by my dad, who was a trumpet player, and I kind of followed in his footsteps. Very cool. But I, I didn't end up going into music, even though like I thought that was going to be the trajectory for me. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I tried, and then I tried to get into the record stuff and uh, ended up <laughs> supplementing my income at a bank. <laughs> And I knew it wasn't for me, man. Mm. Now, I, I'm wondering for you, for, for those who don't know and who are, who are listening and discovering Jenna for the first time, she's got a very successful blog. I would like to call you an influencer, uh, <laughs> not just for painters and watercolor artists, but for all creatives, because you talk about how to start a business. Uh, you talk about feeling stuck and how to get out of a rut. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into all that, but did you always know that this was your fate and this is what you were going to do? Absolutely not. So I actually have a very similar story to you. I grew up playing music. My dad was also a trumpet player, so that no was way. very random. Yeah. Really? Uh -huh. I mean, he wasn't professional or anything. He did it like in high school and college. It wasn't like a serious thing for him. He went into construction and was a chief estimator and all that. So the music the music dreams died hard for him, but right, right. for me, um, that was what I thought my trajectory was growing up. I was in bands and did a lot of shows in college. I was actually living in Chicago throughout college and a little bit after, and so I was playing a lot of blues and jazz and playing at bars there and stuff. I play piano and sing. So I thought that, you know, I would somehow make it into the music biz, um, but I didn't try, right. I didn't try super hard, honestly. Like I was just kind of loving the hanging out with a bunch of dudes, writing music, recording music, and playing shows. And then yeah, I met my husband. Go ahead. Which at that age is what you're kind of supposed to do, That's right? That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. So, but I had absolutely no clue that art would ever be in my career, would even be in my life. I definitely grew up around art supplies. My mom is very creative. She was always doing something with her hands, whether that was like gardening outside all the time or trying her hand at screen printing randomly. And then so we had a bunch of art supplies like at the house and she grew up around her mom who was an acrylic painter. And then my dad's mom was also an acrylic painter. And so we just kind of had it around as like a thing to kill time and not like we ever took it seriously. I never went to art school or, you know, even I took like a high school art class, but I'd never thought of myself as like, ooh, I'm gonna do this one day. I'm really good at this, I'm gonna pursue this. It just kind of became like a, as I was supplementing my music dreams, I was waiting tables in Chicago, deep dish pizza place. Yeah. And we've got some rivalry there with our pizzas. Um, yeah. But it's all good. It's, it's all good. There's good pizza everywhere. That's, That's true. Like it's true. Say. Yeah. So I was supplementing my income or whatever. I was waiting tables and doodling a lot because it was boring. It was high stress. It was just not my dream job, obviously. And so I was always a doodler throughout school, throughout my you know job as a waitress. And then eventually I moved back to home to California and started a job at my uncle's financial planning office. And that was where I had this like really big, like soul moment, I feel like, where my soul and my physical world were just not in sync. And I was sitting in a cubicle, dreading my job, dreading driving an hour each way in traffic, in California traffic on the 405, just like, what am I doing with my life? I was 23 at the time, so I still had a lot of life ahead of me, of course. Mm -hmm. But it was just kind of like, I got a, a degree in psychology. Do I go back to school? Am I like, what am I doing with my life? And I remember just like sitting in my office job, just waiting for it to be five o'clock and like doodling constantly. And this was right around a couple years after Instagram officially like launches and people are starting to post 
on Instagram and it wasn't really used obviously like it is now. There was no such thing no. as an influencer. I'd never heard of that word before. And it was people mostly photos. Right. It was just photos. There was no stories. There was no video. And it was literally people using sapia toned filters and posting yeah. their shoes and their lunch. And like nobody used it as a marketing platform at all. And I definitely was not the pioneer on Instagram, the first person to ever market their work on Instagram, but it became a place for me to share my art that I was doing as like a therapeutic hobby. I would come home, I would sit at my kitchen table and I would paint for hours till three in the morning, get up at five, go to work the next day and then come home and do it all over again. All right, a couple questions before yes. we go on. So you were doodling mm -hmm. throughout from high school to this point. Um, mm -hmm. Did every, anyone or of your friends or your boyfriend say to you, man, you're actually really good. Did you know you were good? Um, there was a point where my, my husband at the time, so we got married really young. I got married when I was 20 and then uh, like right after college and we're still together. And, uh, but he, he's always been extremely supportive. That's something that I definitely attribute a lot of the success with my business is because of how supportive my, my husband was, my parents and everybody around me. And so I think that they were like not really aware of how good I could become. I definitely wasn't good when I started. It wasn't like I, and I personally believe that there, everyone is creative. We both have right and left sides of our brain. We're constantly using and tapping into flow state throughout the day. And we're constantly using our creative solving problem solving. We're just dedicating time to certain things to develop that skill is yeah. where you see results. So anyway, I, um, wasn't, I wouldn't say good or anything like stand out or whatever in high school or college or anything. I just was constantly doing it. And so John, my husband was like, you should probably just like start posting it on Instagram, see what happens or see if like friends want to buy prints or open an Etsy shop or something. And so per his encouragement, that kind of launched me into that. But I definitely wouldn't say I had like a special talent to begin with. And what were those posts? Like they weren't watercolors, were they? Not yet. I got started with calligraphy and uh, pointed pen calligraphy because so this is kind of a random cool story. But when we moved from Chicago back home to Southern California, me and John, um, our like moving truck company accidentally swapped a box of someone else's stuff because they moved like a bunch of people or whatever. It was a massive semi truck. And uh, we started unpacking our stuff and I find this box of art supplies that's not ours and nobody claimed it. We called the moving truck company, nobody claimed it or they didn't have anybody saying they missed a box or whatever. And so I eventually just started playing around with the tools in there and it was a lot of pointed pen calligraphy, a lot of acrylic paint and paint brushes. And acrylic was familiar to me because again, my mom and my grandmother's, but I started uh, like just kind of watering it down and playing around like it was watercolor. Eventually that was like six, seven months later. And so that once I opened up the whole like color and painting and watercolor stuff that completely blew up. Like I, I, right. re I remember I, I only worked for five months at my day job, the office job in finance. Once I started posting on Instagram, I went full time within six or seven months of even starting that job because it just, I started getting booked out. Wow. And this is all because you inadvertently found a box of pens. Thank God it wasn't a lock picking set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you may have been in very jail different. right now. <laughs> yeah. Very different future for me. Indeed. <laughs> Amazing. Um, but I agree. It, it is. I've always thought about, you know, how we spend our time, right? Our it's major choices, mm -hmm. you know, rather than playing guitar hero. For so many hours and learn how to play the damn guitar. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and it's uh, we all have these choices, and for whatever reason, there's certain decisions that are easier for us to make because they're almost a lazy mm. uh, decision. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, you could find the motivation to learn these skills. There's a lot in life you can learn, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of choices you make about how you decide to spend your time and who you spend your time with. Yeah. So I, I do think that's important. Um, as you evolved, well, I've heard you talk about, uh, you, and you just mentioned it now, it was a stressful relief, really. Mm -hmm. Big and time. that became real important to you. Uh, mm -hmm. I watch some of your videos, uh, they're meditation videos. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're cool, man. Um, 
And the one thing I'd like to say on that note too, and, and in general with everything you do, you really provide a lot of value to your followers. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's not contrived. I think that comes natural to you, but I think it is a key to running the business you run. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like, well, like you mentioned it being a stress relief for me, I think that's why it's, I guess, easy in a way for me to give so much value to people on my YouTube channel or Instagram or email list or whatever is because I've seen transformation in my own life and a huge, it's not just like, oh yeah, I've always been an artist and I decided to become a graphic designer and illustrator. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, obviously, but there's just something in me that shifted from being so, feeling so miserable and so lost and even at times being in bouts of depression and whatnot. And then finding this thing that was not only filling me up in terms of like, I can make income off, off of this and I can survive and pay my rent and all of that stuff. Like it wasn't just that, it was also like, it's also calming my anxiety. It's helping me just kind of wind down after a stressful work day. It's helping me really connect to the present moment. So it's, it's an easier gift, I guess, to give to people when you see, especially after 2020, we did a live watercolor, like generating art school is what we called it for three days in a row. We did an uh, art class every single day live on my YouTube channel. And it was like the week lockdown started in the US. And it was just so cool in a way to see that this was like, a huge stress relief for thousands of people that were joining these live videos to be like, we don't know what's happening <laughs> in our world right now. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. This is a really scary time, but we can just take an hour or two hours to kind of ease that anxiety and that stress and worry and kind of put it off to the side a little bit. It's obviously still there. It's going to be there when we get back, but at least we have a little bit of time to just take some breaths, paint, laugh, ask questions, engage. And so seeing that throughout my career, not just obviously through 2020, but just for me personally, and then teaching people is one of my, my biggest passions. And it's so cool to watch people like really transform and their eyes light up and feel like a stress relief in a way, therapeutic in a way. Yeah. I mean, there was something about the lockdown and the shutdown that uh, gave us the permission to break our daily routine and for your followers, spend three days watching you because mm -hmm. they might have been interested in the topic or they might have just been interested in what you were doing as a voyeur in, in the way that we would all watch Bob Ross. I wasn't a painter, but we would watch him and love him. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of people got really interested in watching you and saying, I, I can do this. And then for the pandemic, for me, it allowed me and my family to start making bread together uh, because we had that time, which led to a mm. whole nother creative outlet for all of us. Mm -hmm. So there was something actually good that came yes. out of this pandemic. Um, now, mm. I guess with calligraphy being the thing that you kind of started with making money, I would think, and I could be way off that, like it, it's a little more tangible to see people need invitations, people need this and that, and you could be hired and that could be a source of income. With watercolor, even though I've done some research and I understand how you're doing it, uh, it doesn't seem quite as tangible mm -hmm. at the outset. Yeah. You make money at that. Mm -hmm. At the outset, for sure. But it was also, so like you mentioned, pointed pen calligraphy being popular in the wedding industry. I did a lot of stationery for five years. I was solely, my main income was pretty much just wedding stationery and designing stationary for weddings, events, whatever. And so I'd used a lot of point of pen calligraphy, would scan and digitize that work. And then it was also just kind of when uh, that world was, it watercolor was becoming popular for wedding invitations as well. So it was kind of like I had the perfect timing for both posting my work on Instagram because it wasn't overly saturated, you know, it was kind of a newer platform, but then also breaking into the wedding industry and knowing calligraphy, being able to address envelopes and use the calligraphy for the actual invitations. And then also learning watercolor. And that was starting to get really popular for weddings as well. And so that was, uh-huh. Yeah, back in 2013, 2012, 13, 14, 15, and then it just blew up and it became the most popular 
one of the most, I'm not going to say the most, but it was one of the for most what, for, for wedding for invitations. Day. Like you, so like scanning and digitizing your artwork and then designing the, the paper suite with it and then sending it off to a printer and having like flower, you know, little watercolor flowers in the corners or doing like a watercolor crest was really huge, painting like a monogram and having that as like the header on the invitation and stuff. And so having like hand painted detail that is digitized and repeated and printed was really, really popular when I started doing wedding stationery, connecting with uh, high-end wedding planners that then had clients that were interested in the watercolor and calligraphy business. And so I don't have any formal business training, but I do feel like that is like, I don't know what it is. If it's the firstborn thing, like I'm, a, I'm the oldest child, I don't know what the, the grit is, but I've just always been a really hard worker and I will say yes and figure it out later. And uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah, so here we are today. I'm known to put bread on the menu that I've never made, <laughs> knowing that it's going to end gonna, up getting made. Out. And it's, I'll test it and make sure it's right. That's amazing. Yes. Um, now, you also have a skill set that is unique because you, you went to school for psychology. You must have been interested in, in the field mm -hmm. and you use it now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All the time. You know, I think that combination is what's really killer and special. Um, you talk about getting into flow mm. a lot. Uh, why is that important? And, and help us get there. Mm. So flow state, if you're unfamiliar with, I mean, most people have at least heard the term flow state. Um, even if you don't think that you've ever dropped into flow state, everyone drops into flow state at least twice a day. It's the same type of state, same brain patterns that you'll see picked up from a frequency MRI and an EEG machine, or not an EEG machine, but uh, uh, what am I saying? KG? EKG machine, thank you. So, yeah. so you are the same state as hypnosis. So when you're falling asleep or about to fall asleep, you're kind of teetering on that subconscious and conscious world. And you're like, you could definitely tell you're awake, but it's very like dreamlike state. That's called uh, hypnosis. And it's very similar brain patterns. We're producing theta brain waves and alpha brain waves when we are in flow state, the same brain waves we're producing when we're about to fall asleep or when we're just waking up in the morning. It's so, like a runner who goes into a runner's Yeah, runner's high, high. Right? exactly. Or when an athlete is just like, I don't know what it is, but I'm like so dialed in right now and I'm hitting all my, you know, whatever sport things, um, <laughs> sports. Um, so it's very across the board. Every human enters into flow state. And when you're doing the dishes, you can enter into flow state. When you're driving your car and you lose track of how many exits you've passed, but you've somehow survived, you're in flow state. So hip hypnosis flow state they kind of uh, researchers kind of go back and forth with uh basically calling them the same thing so flow state in my opinion not only is important scientifically it's for brain health it's helping us carve out new shorelines or neural pathways in our brain so if you're stuck in in consistent thought patterns negative thought patterns or whatever or beliefs it's a really helpful therapeutic place to go to help you create and rewire your brain, essentially. So there's this uh, academy called Flow Research Academy, um, and they have done tons and tons of research and scientific studies on flow state and how people with depression or anxiety or these stories that they've told themselves about themselves or about their life or circumstances over and over again and how dropping into flow state every single day and allowing themselves to even doing some sort of like gratitude journal or some sort of like flow writing after is completely transformational for uh, the patterns in your brain and completely like just rewiring. It makes your brain more malleable and makes you help you rewire it. But it also happens to be the place where when you're an artist, an athlete or whatever, where you're creating your best work. So it, flow state is when time is completely not relevant. You're unaware of it. Effort is effortless. And it's like you've done the training beforehand or you haven't and your motor skills, you don't have to tell them what to do. Your brain turns off and you're just in this flowy place where it's just happening and you're kind of watching it happen. I'm sure you've experienced this playing music. 
um, where you're like, damn, I'm playing so good. I don't know where this is coming from, <laughs> um, but it's just kind of flowing out of me. And so flow state, you create your best, most optimal work or optimal performance if you're an athlete, but you're also happening to rewire your brain, restructure your brain and, and change the stories you're telling about yourself in your life, which I think is so fascinating yeah. and so cool and also brings in, ties in my background in psychology. Yeah. So you like to use painting to get people into flow? Yeah, there's a lot of different modalities that I teach um, in my courses, the, uh, specifically my course, The Art Within, that is all about creating your best work, developing your style and dropping into flow state. And I interview a bunch of experts on flow state. But one of the things that because you don't want to there's the four stages of flow and there's always going to be a struggle. There's always going to be a struggle phase, whether you're learning something new or trying something a little bit differently, or you're trying to sit down and just write something because you can get into flow. If you're writing, you can get into flow during meditation. And so I like to, I guess, fire or trigger flow state using a lot of different tools and modalities because sometimes you just don't feel like painting or sometimes you don't feel like writing yeah. or you're getting frustrated and that's going to make you not drop into flow even more if you're getting more pissed off and more pissed off and it's not working. And so if that's happening, I tell people, grab your journal, grab a piece of paper and just do automatic writing exercises, flow writing, where you're just literally not judging what you're writing. You're not thinking about what you're writing. You're just writing. And there's some prompts that we use sometimes. And then if, uh, and that is, I believe, one of the best daily practices to do because you're just getting words on paper and you're not judging it. Instead of like, I'm gonna paint this flower and then judging how it looks because it's much easier to judge the way something looks on canvas or if you're painting something specific than just, oh, I just, I don't know why I wrote that. You know, you're not as yeah. critical. Um, so I love, I love, uh, encouraging people to do flow state writing and meditation to help kind of balance if they're getting frustrated in their art practice. Yeah. I get there pretty often with a lot of different things I do. Uh, mm -hmm. Graphic design could take me into flow. Editing for, for Instagram mm -hmm. or something else. I could, and, the, and, and, I, and I write as well. Uh, and there's been plenty of instances where I'm there and someone like my wife or one of my sons will enter the room uh, innocently <laughs> and kind of interrupt me and I'll be like, what? Yes. <laughs> you know, because you know, uh -huh. I'm like right there. And th they don't understand sometimes uh, that I was actually in a hypnosis at oh, the yeah. moment, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, you're hyper-focused really cool. during flow state. Hyper, hyper-focused. And I yeah. guess... Maybe I'm even addicted to that. That's why I love the things I do. Bread mm. making, um, you get there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't do journal writing, but I feel like I have so many of these other outlets to get there. Totally. You know, mm -hmm. but and I guess journal writing could be something that you put in your arsenal if you need that uh, or interested. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. Really wild. I've actually never been a fan of journaling. The word journaling really throws me off. I'm not like a dear journal, dear diary like type <laughs> of person. I've never gotten into journaling, but automatic writing feels different. And so I don't typically call it journaling because I don't know, it just is weird, bad taste in my mouth. But um, yeah, anybody can just, you could even do it on your phone. You could do a voice note or voice recording and just start sh spilling things, whatever you want, whatever comes up, just don't judge it. That's, that's the key is like, not doing it because you're about to turn it into someone else or your boss. And maybe that's what I'm getting at because I, I kind of work for myself on these things. And if I don't get that graphic done, it doesn't have to go up. Um, and maybe I've figured out a way to take the pressure off mm -hmm. certain things. Mm -hmm. um, totally. Who knows? Um, I've seen you write about an integrator and a visionary. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me and, and tell us a little bit about that? I mean, here's what I'm taking away from it. You are creative, um, right? You have this stuff pouring out of you. At the same time, you might need a collaborator to help uh, either compensate or, you know, help you through other things that might not be your strong suit. Do I have that close? 
Close, yeah. So I, I would actually, have you read the book um, Traction or Rocket Fuel by Gino Wickman? No, if, but I know about it from you. Highly so I, recommend. I've, I've, I've read what you've written about it. Sure. So um, visionary is essentially CEO. It's the same term, essentially. I just, we adopted that term from the book Traction and Rocket Fuel because it feels, especially for like the solopreneur, the small creative business, like I'm the CEO of a company and here's my chief marketing officer and my operations manager. Like it just feels a little too formal, word magic, whatever. But um, visionary essentially is CEO, that's my title. And then my operations manager, which you would call in a traditional workforce operations manager is the integrator. So um, I we do a lot of testing for anybody that we hire, specifically people that come on full time. So my husband's on full time with us. Kelly is my operations manager, or my integrator, and then we have a finance guy, Andres. Um, so small but mighty team. But me as the visionary, we've done a lot of testing through um, this test called human design, um, which I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but basically my design type, my personality, if you will, it's more than just personality, but my design type is projector. And I am like at the top of the mountain looking at all the scene, like designing the scenery, deciding what we should do in six months, 12 months, when the launch should happen, what the course is gonna look like, feel like, whatever, theory, strategy stuff. And then integrator is the one that climbs up the mountain and brings you know, all the things to build the house on the mountain or whatever it is, and helps to actually integrate those ideas. And so Kelly, my integrator, she's very much you know, getting the work done. I obviously do work as well, but there's a lot of like the visionary takes on a lot of ideas and then you have somebody who's able to actually integrate it, initiate those ideas because the theory or the, I guess, idea behind it is like as a solopreneur, which I was a sole business owner for seven years or whatever it was, um, before I hired people, uh, you get burnt out so fast when you are, you know, obviously wearing all of the different hats, you're juggling all the balls in the air, you're not only the person with the creative ideas, you have to then implement all of the ideas, you have to automate your email list, you have to write the blog posts. And so that's the fastest way to exhaustion and burnout, which I definitely experienced. And so when I hit my pretty much rock bottom a few years ago, of feeling like I know I can take this creative business to the next level, but in order to do that, I just can't keep up with writing blog posts, writing emails, answering customer support emails, designing courses, blah, blah, blah. And so that's when I was like, I obviously need to hire someone who is designed in the capacity of integrating things and executing my ideas. Mm. I so. think I suffer from being a solopreneur without that integrator. It's life changing. I highly recommend reading Traction. And then when you are ready to hire someone, read Rocket Fuel, because that's kind of like the team management version of Traction. Mm -hmm. um, but Traction's like the strategy behind it and how to, and he, he's a, like, he travels globally to t uh, talk about this to huge Fortune 500 businesses and he's helped small businesses. And so it's a really helpful book for business owners. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I was the integrator for 25 years for an actor named Dennis Leary. Hmm. I ran his production company, and it was largely his vision, mm -hmm. especially, God, over the first 15 years of it. And I was the integrator. Hmm. And I enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, but then, you know, I got the visionary bug myself. <laughs> Do you think that there's a, a danger if, if two visionaries, I'm being serious, mm -hmm. like, partner up without an integrator? Yes, absolutely. No doubt in my mind. Um, so human design, people should look it up after, but I'm a projector. My husband is a manifesting generator. This is going to be complex and not make sense fully, but I'll just try to explain it. But basically he's a, he has both capabilities. He's both visionary. It's not technically that in human design, but essentially he's a visionary and also a person who gets the shit done and implements stuff and he's, integrates. He's a filmmaker, right? Yeah, he's a videographer. He does all the YouTube stuff, all the course videos and editing and stuff. And so there are times where we are like, he's trying to get the creative vision going, but he's not in his generator part of his personality. And I'm obviously pretty much only visionary ideas, creativity. And so that is where we rub a little bit. And it's kind of like, well, who's gonna do it? Because <laughs> like, you know, 
that's a great idea, but like, what do we do now? And so we have to have someone like Kelly who's like, okay, here's all the steps to take to implement it. And when we're gonna launch it, that doesn't make sense to do it on your timeline because here's why, and all these steps that we have to do before then, we have to make sure this and that and all these tweaks. And so I, um, I'm sure there's companies out there that are doing it successfully, but in terms of like reaching your ceiling and going to the next level, I have no doubt in my mind that it's absolutely imperative that you have an integrator in order to reach those new growth capacities in business and to not get stuck. Wow. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it work. I've been involved with it working um, and I'm involved with not having that support. Mm -hmm. uh, to the full extent, you know, my wife works full time and she certainly helps out. She does a lot of a lot of the stuff an integrator would, would do, but we don't really have a full time mm. person. So that, that's pretty crazy. Um, you've had fans all over the world. <laughs> I was watching. You did a YouTube live two days ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went on oh. watercolor for beginners. Yes. And it was really cool, by the way, like that's where I got the thing I said earlier. It's like, oh, you could just watch this and chill out, <laughs> yeah. drink a glass of wine. <laughs> but then I'm like, I got to get this stuff, man. I think <laughs> I could do this. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's I'm fun. telling you, it, the listeners out there, I'm telling you, go on to Jenna Rainey's YouTube and check out some of these videos. You're going to get hooked. You're going to at least enjoy watching them. And I guarantee you a percentage of you are going to go out and buy <laughs> a book. Uh, I know we like the rough paper, not the smooth paper. That's right. Look at right? you. Look at you. <laughs> what else do we like? Uh, I wrote them down somewhere. <laughs> There's all kinds of tools we need to do this. Like, what does it take to, to start off? Or could we do that from your website? Oh, I, I have want to start painting. Yeah. So you can go on my website. I definitely have a lot of like blogs with links to supplies. But if you go to generaney.com forward slash Amazon, all the supplies are linked in there and whatever. You could buy them on Blick if you want. You don't have to buy them on, on Amazon with my affiliate link. But um, there and then every single one of my YouTube uh, videos on my channel has all my supplies. But yeah, that was that was a huge game changer for me, a big shift for me in my work uh, it was like about a year into me painting with a watered down acrylic. Essentially, I discovered uh, better supplies. I was at a local art supply store and someone was like, you know, you should try out these brushes. And I've been using the same brushes ever since and the same uh, pigments and all of that. So. Right. It's a big game changer having good supplies, which I talk about a lot on my YouTube channel. But yeah, all the links are there and generating.com forward slash Amazon. So when you started doing the licensing, you had to figure out how to do that. You never licensed anything. You didn't know about licensing. Yep. Um, and I thought that's where you're going to go with the integrator too, because I know you stumbled upon through a friend, you found an agent. Yes. That was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Cause there are experts in that world. I deal with, uh, you know, comedians and talent that might license things or an evolve, involved in licensing and branding deals. And we deal with agents that specialize in that. Mm -hmm. How did you know to get an agent or how did that come up? Absolutely not. It was super random. So in 2017 or 18, I was doing wedding stationery still full time. That was basically my only thing besides teaching watercolor classes like on the weekends. Um, and I had a random small ish yoga towel company find me on instagram and say like how much would you charge for three prints to go on our yoga towels they're probably going to be sold in nordstrom or some you know like yoga places and i was like i don't know let me get back to you but i would love to do that so i had obviously no idea what to charge because up until then i'd only been a client's based business and charging people design fees and you know marking up printing costs and material costs but i had no idea about royalties or advance payments vice versa and which strategy to go with with different brands and why it matters to have an advanced for some for some uh uh, partnerships and not for others and to do royalties instead or both. 
So I was obviously very, very, like, had no idea what I was getting into, but I did remember I taught a workshop in New York in Dumbo, and uh, like a year or two previous to that, and I remember the store owner, her name's Dabney Lee, um, saying that she licenses her work. She has work in Barnes and Noble and Target and all these places, and I was like, oh, she probably knows what to do or what to charge in this scenario. And so me being the noob and not knowing anything, being completely naive, I just texted her, was like, hey, what would you charge for this? And it's so nuanced. There's so many factors to pricing uh, designed to be then licensed or whatever. And so she was like, here's my agent's contact information. You should, you should talk to her. And so I had a phone call with Julie Turkel, my licensing agent, and we started working together. And that was roughly 2018. We've been working together for like four years now or something. 2019 maybe and we've had partnerships in staples and target and uh toki mats we've had like baby products and pajamas and toys and things and so it's been a totally cool new avenue of work as a creative you you have options to obviously work with clients and that can kind of feel like you're chained to a desk 24 7 and you're just kind of at the will of your client and if they want changes to things you have to do it essentially obviously not every time but for me, it was a really nice kind of like new direction to go with the art business thing because then I could have work that's in a library in Dropbox or whatever that manufacturing companies and retail companies can just choose from and it's already done and I can make royalties for wow. the term of the contract. It can be a year or it can be indefinitely. It could be five years, whatever, and I can make royalties. I can make money on that art that I did five, ten years ago in 15 years so it's a really cool and now we have me and julie have an online course called brand plus brand that teaches artists how to get into licensing work with agents and manufacturing companies and stuff where does pitching come in for you do you have to pitch ideas to these types of places yeah so pitching is a very important piece of the puzzle in licensing and also in general but for licensing specifically that's the role of the agent so the agent, uh, my agent specifically, she's been in the business for 25 years. So it's it was really attractive to me to work with her because she has all these connections already and she's already gotten licenses for Dabney Lee and for her other clients in places like Target, Staples, et cetera. And so because she already has those connections, like I don't have to do the research and figure out like who the buyer is or who the licensing contact at Staples is or at the... Yeah companies that license in staples or whatever like i don't have to do that research i don't have to make those connections and probably hear no a lot so thankfully or, or not here at all or not here at all probably most likely so yeah. working with julie had would definitely um was really beneficial for me in terms of like having those connections already built in um but i have gotten a lot of partnerships just solely based on off of people seeing my social media or finding me on YouTube and stuff. But pitching, something we coach in Brand Plus Brand for artists who maybe don't have a following or they don't want to work with an agent because obviously they do take a percentage of what you earn. They, tons of people are, there's so many successful artists out there that fall into that category, no audience and also no agent who are pitching constantly. And it's all about being at the right place at the right time with the right work and being able to like, forecast trends and stuff so we teach all of that in that course but pitching would definitely fall under the julie or the agent um, category if you have one wow that's a lot of stuff you have a lot of different lanes <laughs> yeah. uh, and some of that's by design because mm -hmm. you also talk about uh you know as an artist it is important to diversify mm -hmm. which is something that i figured out in the the type of artist that i am um i'm not always going to be lucky enough to have a television show on the air. Some people have one in their lifetime, um, you know, so mm -hmm. while I do that and continue to develop those shows, I do work with other talent and help coach them mm -hmm. and uh, manage some careers. Uh, mm -hmm. It's important to diversify. And you discovered that on your own? Essentially, by accident. You know, when I was um, a wedding stationery designer, I was feeling very, very burnt out. I was also getting really sick. My health was taking a toll um, because I was working 80 plus hours a week, and that's just not physically possible to do long term. And so I knew that, again, it's maybe my design, psychology, being the firstborn, I'm not sure, but I just knew that I had to just find other lanes to add to my business. And 
figure it out because I couldn't quit this. Like, it, 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 we're gonna make it work somehow. So anyway, I when I was still designing Wedding Stationery, I started teaching workshops every weekend. Literally every weekend I was teaching from like nine to two on Saturdays in back-to-back -back classes. Um, so I added that when I was a wedding stationery designer and then I eventually added online classes through other people's platforms. So like Brit & Co, I would go up to San Francisco and I'd film a watercolor class or a design class or whatever. And then I would earn commission off of the sales of that class through their platform. So that started like kind of breaking into my business at random um, because I was teaching in-person workshops and I loved it. I was loving teaching and I think I'm really good at teaching that company or whatever, I reached out to that company and they were like, oh, she already has the track record of being a good teacher and blah, blah, blah. So they took the chance on me uh, doing that. But then um, that's also around the time three years into my business full time is around the time when I had a literary agent approach me because she met my mom at her gym. Oh, and you never know. You never know. <laughs> those moms too, they just, they yeah. brag about their kids. And they're like, you should check out my daughter on Instagram. And so anyway, she followed me on Instagram and reached out randomly and was like, would you ever want to write a book? And so that's when we pitched to the top five publishers in the country and Penguin Random House said, yeah, sure, let's do it. But we don't want to do a coloring book, which was what our pitch was, because uh, coloring books had already kind of like peaked um, at the time. And so they were like, would she be interested in doing a watercolor book? And so that's when Everyday Watercolor was birthed. Anyway, I just kind of caught the bug of like doing as many things as I can to like diversify my income, like you said, but also to reach passive income. Passive income. Because yeah. it does sound like you're adding hours to your day by adding a lot of these things. It does sound um, like it. Mm -hmm. but, but ultimately, you, you probably prioritize the ones that were working, and then you add it to the team. Yes, crucial. Because you know, that's another thing you talk about is balance and being able to be present mm -hmm. at home, which mm -hmm. is hard when you're first starting these things out. You, I mean, you do everything you can, but like you said, over time, you're going to say, this is not really possible to carry on mm -hmm. for this way forever. Yeah. Um, so you teach some in-person classes. Uh, actually, right before I get to that, how your mother spoke to this agent is part of that someone called, you know, luck have to do with the geography of being in proximity to Los Angeles and there are a lot of literary agents out there or not at all? I have never met a literary agent in my life growing up here in essentially huh. Newport Beach. I've never met one. And she was like, not quite yet a literary agent. She was like wanting to start her agency. Wow. And then she eventually moved to New York and started her agency and oh. has a bunch of clients and stuff. So it, I, I, I guess it's luck. It's also, but in my, like just my belief system, I feel like it's soul design. Like the, the, whether it was her or not, there was, or whether it was a book or not, this was already going to be my trajectory and my path some way, somehow teaching, and um, she, you. you know, right place, right time. Like people say to me, oh, you're lucky you've met Dennis Leary. And yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I, I d certainly was and I owe a lot to him. But mm -hmm. I put myself in a position to be lucky. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't yeah. nepotism. It wasn't whatever. I, I figured out how to get in those spots. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. it wasn't for that, it would have been something else. Who knows? Right. Um, but you teach these live classes. And uh, I'm curious, you, you know, every personality in the class is different. Yes. Um, I can tell almost immediately who's going to be who, though. You can. Mm hmm. Yeah. Again, my, it might be the psychology background or whatever it is, but there's always the person who is really timid in the direction of being perfectionist. Yeah. or in the direction of insecurity, lack of confidence, negative self-talk. So there's that, those two paths with the, with the timid or shy or whatever approach. The ones that look really stiff are usually the ones that are maybe a little bit more on the, and obviously I'm generalizing, it's not always yeah. the case, but I've taught thousands of in-person workshops and art retreats. 
and I can almost immediately tell who's going to be who just based off of their body language when they walk in the class. I can tell who's going to be just like big and bold and vibrant and maybe not listen to me very well, but kind of just do their own thing. I can tell the person who's really shy, really tense and timid and who's going to be really critical, but I know what to say to them to unlock their just, I guess, desire or, or just help them because it's really already within each of us. It just takes a little bit of an unlock to go down that path of flow state or creating things with confidence and creating something every day, even if it sucks, is kind of like my motto. So anyway, I can kind of tell um, who's right. gonna be who in the class and it's really fun for me. I think that's again where like my therapy psychology background comes in. It's just fun to read people and see what's yeah. gonna come of it and make people feel more comfortable and confident so that they can p pick up the paintbrush and just like put it down and not be so critical. Have you ever been invited to teach a private watercolor class at a famous celebrity's house and the <laughs> yes. celebrity ended up not listening? Yeah, that was William Shatner. Um, not surprising to me. I was trying to, to get you to go. <laughs> yeah, he was so much fun, like so much fun. Uh, his daughter, Melanie Gretsch, was the one that reached out and it was like a family reunion. He had just turned 92 or something. And um, yeah. his kids were there, Melanie and the other, I can't remember their names, the other daughters and son that he has. And then their in uh, their, his in-laws, um and their kids so his grandkids were there so it was a really big group and private on the cliff and this cliff in malibu ocean view beautiful like infinity pool private chef margaritas being brought out like all the things yeah. and he sits directly across from me at the end of the table i'm at the other end of the table and i can tell he's he like a very he's an archetype you know we all have certain we gravitate towards certain archetypes or personality types in class environments in big group environments and he was the archetype not to generalize again but he was the archetype type of like i got this figured out like let's just kind of get through this and like you know whatever but he's fun he has great personality he was making so many jokes it was hilarious and there's this one thing that i pretty much say in all of my classes um but i say like happy accidents happen as Bob Ross would say because Bob Ross coined the phrase happy accidents so like don't worry about mixing the wrong color or putting the wrong thing down or it doesn't look right like happy accidents and he goes oh happy accidents I know a lot about happy accidents and he looks at his kids and he's like a lot of you guys are happy accidents <laughs> and so that just like opened everything everybody was like relaxed and I knew like he I knew immediately he was not going to stay on task with where I was in the class and it didn't get to me. You know, he, I have people in every single class that do that. And so what I do with that type of person is I just come around and I give them more special one on one time and I and I show them I actually pick up their paintbrush and on their paper, I show them what I'm doing and they always go, oh, my gosh. Wait, right. that's what you can do with watercolor or whatever. And so then that that kind of puts a surge of excitement. So he got really excited about watercolor. He actually did a really good job. He was like painting a landscape, the little scene outside the house with the ocean and stuff. He did a really good job and he loved it. And he was like, that was one of the best art classes I've ever had. You're a fantastic picture teacher. The, picture the whole thing. I love <laughs> it was that so story. fun. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, last question. I'm going to put you on the spot. No, oh, no. Can you recall one of your most memorable meals mm. and tell us why it was memorable oh. it doesn't have to be the most amazing food it might be the company it might not mm. definitely company is a huge factor for me also food i know i don't know if we mentioned this in email but i make sourdough too so we're bread makers no. together yeah I picked oh, it up. Oh man, I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> I don't think I, I told you actually. No, I didn't know. Yeah, so I do sourdough. That's it. That's where it caps. I don't do anything else. But um, so food I know is you very also important to me. On your website, you like pizza. That's your weakness. Mm, it is my weakness. I'm a I'm a foodie. Um, dang, that's a good question. Um, I would say the one that keeps coming to mind, even though I don't think it's like the most fantastic meal that I've ever had, but it was really, really good. And the company was amazing. The whole vibe was dope <laughs> too, was Lee Ho Fook Bar in Melbourne, Australia. I was there on book tour with my husband and we just literally booked 
a new restaurant every hour because we had 48 hours in Melbourne and we wanted and we knew it was like a really good food scene and so we wanted to just like eat as much as we possibly could which was very physically painful um at the end but we in the middle of everything we were just wandering around this I don't even remember the area of the city but it was like graffiti art everywhere whatever and we stumbled upon Liho Fook Bar which is like under another place that we went to and the fried eggplant took me to another realm it was absolutely beautiful and it was just the whole day weaving around these streets and like being immersed in the city and going to this other bar speakeasy place right before and just kind of like that riding on that vibration I guess and then stumbling on this amazing place and it was all like neon lights and crazy art in there and dark and vibey it was great sounds amazing Mm -hmm. sounds amazing well I appreciate you talking to me it went fast um (laughs) Big fan of yours. Um, I don't have a ton of time to add another hobby, but I just might try it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I encourage everyone to check out JennaRain.com. Check out Jenna on Instagram, Facebook, all the socials. Uh, go to Amazon. She's got a series of books and more to come. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate you sitting down with me. Thank you so much. That was so much fun. And um, I love being on podcasts. And yours was, you're such a good interview viewer. So thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too.